So imagine for a second your Congress. That was supposed to be a joke. Actually, the Second Continental Congress, uh, Second Continental Congress, because we're just a few more than uh, were seated in Independence Hall, the Pennsylvania State House, on this exact day, 241 years ago, 1775. This is, of course, the day when the young, not so young anymore, Virginia Colonel George Washington um, was was voted uh, general and commander in chief of the Continental Army. Now, um, you know, we've heard. Uh, this morning from several speakers and, and Gordon quite, um, I think, eloquently talking about, in a sense, with a historian's perspective, looking back, the revolution, it, it seems inevitable that um, American independence would have come at some point. But of course, from the perspective of George Washington on this day, 241 years ago, uh, when he wondered aloud if, if his talents were equal to the honor that had been given to him, and certainly on the part of the men that he was about to take command of, uh, as many of their flags said, exitus and dubio est, the outcome is in doubt. And, and so certainly from the spectrum perspective of the period. It was very much a question if um, the, the glorious cause would be a victory in the end for American independence. And so today we're going to reflect on um, two players in the drama that we've heard a lot about this morning, but in much more abstract terms, the, the American army, uh, led by General Washington, and the French Navy, which we've been hearing a lot about as the hero of the day, but we're going to get into a bit more detail. So for the first um, short 15, 20 minutes, uh, Ed Lengel, who many of you will know as the um, professor of history at the University of Virginia and the uh, general editor and director of the Washington Papers at the University of Virginia, and probably is now the preeminent authority on all things General Washington and the military history of the American Revolution. He's gonna share some insights into Washington's leadership, into um, the many American armies that existed during uh, the Revolutionary War. Of course, as Alan Taylor mentioned this morning, it's we can't speak about the American army. There is uh, a total, continuously evolving character of the American army from the early exciting days of 1775, 76 through the long eight years of war. So please join me in welcoming Ed Lengel for a little discussion of the American army. Good afternoon. So I'm, I'm going to make uh, just a few points that I think are salient about Washington, the American army. I mean, I could talk about the land war and the Revolutionary War. I would be here all afternoon to your great sorrow. So I will uh, try to focus on what I think are, are a few of the most interesting points about Washington's leadership, the management of the Continental Army, and how that Continental Army or armies in different areas uh, evolved over the course of the war. Uh, one of the things I, I just wanted to mention to start out, Canada came up a number of times this morning, and there is a fascinating exchange in the papers of George Washington in the fall of 1779, as I recall, when there was a very real prospect of a fresh invasion of Canada by a Franco-American army. This was advocated quite strongly by Lafayette and by Horatio Gates, as well as many members of Congress. Washington became, the more he studied the prospect, and they were already in the process of laying out depots to prepare for a, a new assault on Canada, Washington became increasingly opposed to the prospect, so he wrote a public letter to Congress, and then president of Congress, uh, Henry Lawrence, I believe it was, as I recall, pointing out all of the logistical reasons why an invasion of Canada was not a good idea. On the same day, he wrote a private letter to the President of Congress explaining the real reasons why he thought an invasion of Canada was a bad idea. And what it boiled down to, in essence, was that if you let the French back into Canada, they will be in a position, and this is a direct quote, to give law to these states. 
So Washington and after that, the whole prospect of an invasion of Canada fizzled, partly as in consequence of Washington's strong opposition to it, partly for other reasons. But it shows Washington on the one hand as being a strategic thinker, and on the other hand, continuing to remain deep down some suspicion of the French and French strategic aims in the alliance in this war. And certainly we can credit Washington for, for many things, and rightfully so, as well as Rochambeau for the alliance that they developed and, and the scrupulously careful relationship that they developed. So it was a great partnership. But underneath there were other thoughts in mind. Washington was one of the very few American commanders who was able to think simultaneously in terms of the land war and the war on the seas, as Jonathan will be talking about in a few moments. I want to make a, just a few points about Washington and his, his leadership in the war. Um, and a few of these are some myths that I think need to be exploded, and a few of them are things that just very recently in my study of the war that have become apparent to me. One, in terms of a myth to be exploded, is that Washington was not, despite what you've heard in your textbooks, a Fabian warrior. That's a myth that should have been thrown out the window a long time ago. It dates from the Vietnam era, and the concept that Washington thought from the very beginning solely in terms of preserving his army, and in some respects outlasting the British. The longer he could preserve his army, the longer he could hold on, the more likely the British were to give up the fight. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Washington felt from the very beginning that time was not on our side. He felt when he looked at the big picture, he looked at the British economy, which was, yes, heavily debted, but it was an economy, an independent economy. We had no economy. We had no government. We had no army. We had no navy. We had no nothing. When we began the war, we have to create this from scratch. He felt if you go over the long term, we are more likely to lose than to win. He felt that our best hope lay in winning a quick and spectacular victory through a battle such as Yorktown. Of course, he didn't know that's where the victory would eventually take place, but it's what he was looking for from the very beginning. Part of this comes from something that the more I think about it, 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 it seems kind of obvious, but we don't conceptualize it in our minds. George Washington was a combat veteran when he became commander-in-chief of the Continental Army. And because he was a combat veteran, this may sound like an oxymoron, but in fact, it is completely, completely true, he was a man of peace, as only a combat veteran can be. He understood from the larger perspective as well as the personal perspective, what war would do to individuals, to societies, to economies, to governments, to communities over the long term. And he felt we've got to get this war over with as soon as possible. Another thing that's extremely important is that Washington believed from the very beginning this is not a victory at all costs. He passionately believed in the cause. As, as Gordon pointed out during, during the uh, panel that we just heard, when Washington appeared in his uniform, he was saying, I'm ready to fight. He was recognizing the war, had, the, the conflict had changed its dynamic to a military dynamic. He was not necessarily saying he wanted to be in charge. He was saying he was willing to fight. But the ultimate goal is not win the war at all costs so that at the end you're sitting on top of a heap of ashes. He specifically rejected the idea of a protracted, no holds bar, no rules, guerrilla type war. He wanted a conventional war, not just because that's what he was familiar with, but because he believed that we must fight while simultaneously preserving the foundation of our future prosperity as a nation. That was absolutely integral to his strategy. Maintain develop a civilian infrastructure, a governing structure, an economy, and society. One result of this, and the way he thought about the war, was that 
Whatever we may think, George Washington did not think in terms of fixed categories of attitudes toward the war. X percent patriots, X percent loyalists, X percent in the middle. He wrote very early on in the war that interest, interest is the governing principle of mankind. And this is something that was in direct contradiction to what many of his colleagues and patriots felt. Many, or I would say most, if not all, American patriots, especially the leaders in 1775, thought the will to victory, the goodness of your cause, the passionate belief in what you're fighting for is in of itself sufficient for victory. And that if at any point you turn away from that cause, you're a traitor. Now, Washington recognized you can be the greatest patriot in the world, but think about it for a second for yourselves. In particular, I think this war could not have been won without the women of America who were really on the front lines every day at their homes, wherever they may have been. Are you still a patriot if you say, I want to win this war, but not if it means my children starve to death? I want to win this war, but not if it means reducing my community to absolute ruin and destruction. Washington recognized that people's attitudes are constantly in flux. They constantly shift according to their perception of where their interests lay. That does not mean selfishness. That means you recognize you have to have hope for the future for your survival, the survival of your families, your communities. And it was for that reason Washington fought the war, emphasizing that the army must show that it shares the same interests, that it is part of the popular movement. It is not separate as those who feared standing armies thought. The army would become a separate force in of itself. But it must show that it identifies wholly with the popular cause. One of the results of that is the British go into winter encampment, or the British occupy New Jersey and cantonments, or they occupy Philadelphia, the American army, the Continental Army, whether in its formal shape or in the form of the partisan bands, must constantly be there, must constantly be present. And symbolically, he does such things as open up markets whenever he uh, establishes winter camp for that constant interaction with the people prohibiting plundering, prohibiting, prohibiting uh, any kind of depredations on your own civilians, always emphasizing subordinate, the subordinate relationship of the army to the civilian sphere. And I will finish my brief remarks with just one point uh, or two about the transformation of the Continental Army under Washington's leadership. He was a superb administrator. I've, I've written about that elsewhere. But although the Continental Army, from the time the French entered the war up until Yorktown, definitely went through very tough times, as Alan pointed out, I think extremely well. Uh, the the, the uh, suffering, the lack of clothing, lack of food, lack of pay, absolutely these, these uh, individuals in the Army went through a whole lot. But at the same time, Washington himself did not sit back and say, Oh, the French are here. Now we can relax. He worked, he bent every nerve as well as his officers and staff to transform the army. And one of the things that he did, in addition to having people like Steuben, one of the great uh, heroes of the revolution, to transform army training and discipline and maneuver, was that Washington worked on when he's sitting, when he's up there around New York. He's not just saying, I'm too weak to attack New York, so I'm just going to sit here. He's saying, first of all, I have to protect the Hudson, West Point, but second, I'm going to change the nature of this army. I did some work recently on assessment, on intelligence. At the beginning of the war, and I'll wrap up with this, at the beginning of the war, when Washington or his officers need to make a decision about what they're going to do militarily, he has no idea what the enemy are doing or where they are. He doesn't even understand his own forces, what his capabilities are, where they're deployed, what type of weaponry or supplies they have. He has to operate on hearsay. By contrast, 
In 1781, when Washington is conferring with Rochambeau and talking about a grand assault on New York City, which he was absolutely obsessed with for a time because he thought that's where the war would end, the French and the Americans attacking New York City. When he learns that Admiral de Grasse has arrived off the Virginia Capes instead of off New York, Washington has to make a split-second decision in effect. Do you stay here and work on New York, or do you change your focus and go down to Yorktown? He's able to make that decision because he right away, he knows where the British are, what their capabilities are, where their forces are, all the way from New York to Virginia and their land forces. He also knows where all of his forces are deployed. He has all that information immediately at his command, and from a study, a thorough study of that over a period of a day or two, he can say, this is possible, we move now. So human contingency is always extremely important in, uh, in history, generally. Uh, and I think nowhere is that more true than in the conduct of the land campaign and the Revolutionary War, and particularly in George Washington's leadership and those of his many deputies and people, even individual people at their farms who were making decisions every day of what they were going to do. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. If it's uh, agreeable to, to you all, we're going to save all, uh, sort of group the questions at the end. So we'll. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Jonathan Dull uh, next, uh, again, one of the, the preeminent scholars on the role of the French army, French diplomacy in the 18th century, the French uh, Navy, sorry, French Navy in the Seven Years' War, and his book, The French Navy and American Independence, which uh, is about to be reissued or has been reissued by Princeton University Press. If anyone's interested in a copy, Jonathan and myself have a few flyers there that can pick up that that work. Uh, Jonathan is a fascinating character. He's a native of Ohio, and I've, I've recently learned, um, educated by the United States uh, Navy in the South China Sea, and then Berkeley, and then uh, did a short stint in Texas, which he described as sort of like Berkeley with scorpions, which I thought was a wonderfully evocative observation. Uh, but going from Ohio to uh, Southeast Asia to California to Texas, he shared that the greatest cultural jolt of his entire life was moving to New Haven, Connecticut um, and encountering uh, the Yankees up there, uh, where he spent 31 years with the Benjamin Franklin papers and uh, has just retired a few years ago and is now busier than ever uh, publishing and writing. And so please welcome Jonathan Dull on the French Navy and the American Revolution. Thank you very much. The title of my talk is, Why Was the French Navy So Successful? Between 1688 and 1815, the French Navy fought seven wars against the British Navy. In six of these wars, it was defeated. The War of American Independence was the exception. In spite of setbacks during 1782, the French Navy was largely successful, and it played a vital part and America's achieving its independence. I would like to spend a few moments discussing why this war was different from the others. I don't think it had much to do with national character. The 18th century French Navy had a reputation for timidity, while the French army had a reputation for boldness. In the American War, however, the French Navy had admirals like Suffren and Le Maupiquet who were renowned for their audacity it's difficult to understand why French admirals should differ from French generals, or why in the American War, the fifth of the seven French admirals should differ from their predecessors and their successors. Instead, I think external factors accounted for the behavior of French admirals in all the wars. Let me discuss some of those factors. One factor stands out. During the American War, the French Navy had enough ships and enough sailors for its leaders to take risks. In the other wars, the French Navy was so badly outnumbered that it had to act so as to conserve its limited assets. The number of trained sailors was as important as the number of ships. In early 1778, the Comte de Vergennes, the French foreign minister, received a report, probably from the Navy Department, that stated, quote, it is not at all by the number of ships of the line that the 
English compute their naval forces, but rather by the number of sailors. The size of all navies was, in fact, almost always determined by the number of its sailors. Between June 1758 and June 1759, during the previous war, for example, the number of French ships of the line declined from 42 to 25. The drop was not because of any battle, but because an epidemic in the autumn and winter of 1758 had lost the lives of 6,000 irreplaceable seamen. The War of American Independence was no different. Between mid-1778 and mid-1781, the French Navy gradually expanded from 52 ships of the line in service to 70 ships of the line. Desperate to finish the war, the French expanded their navy too much. By April 1782, it had 73 in use, but to reach that number, it had to shortchange training, particularly of junior officers. The results were disastrous. From 1778 through 1781, the French Navy lost three ships of the line to accidental fires, but only one in action. In 1782, however, it had lost 11 in combat and five more to shipwreck or storm. Meanwhile, the British Navy continued to grow, peaking at 99 ships of the line late in 1782. The great British historian Piers Mackesy argues that had the war continued another year, Great Britain would have won. Vergen and his chief assistants, J.M. Girard de Renneval, regarded the peace reached at the end of 1782 as a miracle that saved France from likely catastrophe. Nonetheless, the French Navy accomplished wonders between 1778 and early 1782 that its later failures did not undo. What accounts for its success? One reason is that the American War was the only one of the seven wars with Britain in which the French had adequate time to prepare by gathering sailors, assembling naval supplies, and repairing its ships. Naval preparations began upon King Louis XVI's approval of a naval rearmament program on April 22, 1776. Hostilities with Britain began on June 17, 1778. During those two years, the French Navy completed the overhaul of 26 ships of the line and launched five others, beginning the war with 52 in service, close enough to Britain's 66 that it could send a dozen ships of the line to North America. This is similar to what the Japanese Navy did in 1941 when it repaired virtually every one of its major ships, giving it an initial advantage over the American Navy. A second factor in the French Navy's success was, was that for once it had enough money. The importance of financial factors can hardly be overestimated. In 1499, King Louis XII was advised that there were three important things in making war. Money, more money, and still more money. Things were no different three centuries later. In the 1790s, Henry Dundas, the director of the British Army, described war as a contest of purse. In other wars, the French had to spend most of its, France had to spend most of its money on the army. During the American War, Europe was at peace, and the French army faced few demands except for sending minor forces to America and the Caribbean and to help the Spaniards capture the Mediterranean island Menorca. The Navy was able to spend gigantic sums, perhaps a billion livre tournois, French pounds, equivalent in today's terms to several billion dollars. Instead of being outspent by the British Navy by more than two to one, as during the War of the Austrian Succession, or three to one, as in the Seven Years' War, it enjoyed near parity. One of the greatest architects of American independence was Jacques Necker, the French monarchy's finance minister. Necker eventually blanched at the cost of the war and was removed from office, but for several years he achieved miracles in raising loans to finance the war. He did so by offering outrageously high returns, including selling annuities that could be settled on whoever the buyer wished. Bankers discovered that those with the highest life expectancy were teenage girls in the peaceful city of Geneva. The famous Demoiselle de Genève were courted not by suitors with flowers in hand, but by bankers with pens in hand to sign them up, or rather their parents, since the young ladies had to be protected from the dangers of childbearing. Necker was not only an architect of American independence, but also as an architect of the French Revolution by inflicting debts on King Louis XVI that drove the monarchy into bankruptcy and left it, to vulner and left it vulnerable to revolution. Speaking of King Louis XVI, we must give credit for French naval success to the monarchy, which fits in with the theme of Versailles and the American Revolution. 
We need to begin, however, with Louis's grandfather, King Louis XV. To my surprise, I came doing 20 years' work in the Seven Years' War to love King Louis XV, who was indirectly the earliest architect of American independence. The Seven Years' War of 1755 to 62 was a major setback for France, but thanks to Louis's indomitable courage, it was not the disaster it could have been. France lost Canada, but by occupying Hesketh, a traditional source of troops for the British Army, the Hessians, they retained a vital bargaining chip for the peace negotiations of 1762. William Pitt hoped to destroy French sea power permanently by depriving the French of access to the Newfoundland fishery, which was needed to train sailors. When Canada was lost and the French Navy crippled, Louis did not despair, temporarily demobilizing the Navy to find money for his army in Germany. The British, unwilling to continue the expenses of the war, granted peace terms by which France regained access to the fishery and recovered its Caribbean colonies of Martinique and Guadeloupe, whose trade was also needed for training sailors. Louis died soon before the American Revolution, but his grandson inherited from him a healthy merchant marine and fishing fleet, as well as a reasonable number of warships. King Louis XVI lacked his grandfather's shrewdness but he too refused to give up when more dangerously strained his finances. Ironically, he was reluctant to become involved in the American conflict, which undercut his hopes for domestic reforms. He was maneuvered into helping the Americans by Foreign Minister Vergen, who was desperate to weaken Britain. During King Louis XV's reign, Vergen had been a key member of a secret organization run directly by the king, the King's Secret, or Le Secret de Roi. Its purpose was to counter Russian expansionism, either directly or through depriving it of the support of Great Britain, which Louis and Vergen regarded as Russia's chief backer. Vergen's ultimate target in the American war was not Britain, but Russia, which threatened France's friends, the Poles, the Swedes, and the Turks. During the peace negotiations of 1782, British Prime Minister Shelburne dangled the possibility of British help against Russia during the ongoing Crimean crisis. Plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. After the war, Bourgen lamented the long animosity between Britain and France, which had made possible the growth of Russia. The French war effort was directed by a triumvirate consisting of Bourgen, the Comte de Maurepas, a former naval minister who was Louis's unofficial chief minister, and Antoine Raymond Guarbert Gabriel de Sartine, the current French naval minister. During the 18th century, the British Navy had sturdier ships, better trained sailors, and a large number of brilliant admirals. France, however, had some superb naval ministers, and Sartine was perhaps the best of them. Before becoming naval minister in 1774, he had been head of the Paris police. A perhaps apocryphal story relates that a friend of his wagered him that he could remain incognito in Paris. A short time after checking into a hotel under an assumed name, he was visited by a policeman with Sartine's greetings. Sartine was also a member of the King's Secret. He and Vergen worked together to buy off the Chevalier Dion, a member of the organization in England, who was threatening to reveal its secret mapping of possible landing sites on the English coast. The agent they sent to England to meet with the blackmailer was the playwright, Pierre-Augustin Caron de Montmarché, whose success led them to pick him again in 1776, when they set up a dummy trading company, Raoul Hoyles and Company, to provide arms to the American rebels. Although Sartine was, had no experience in the Navy, he was a magnificent administrator who selected as his assistant a naval officer named the Chevalier de Fleurieu, who served briefly as naval minister during the French Revolution. The closest American equivalent was a superb Civil War team of Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells, a former newspaper editor, and his undersecretary Gustavus Fox, a former naval officer. Sartine's greatest moment came in 1778. The French Mediterranean fleet had been sent to America. Sartine sent every ship in the line in the Atlantic fleet to challenge a British fleet operating off the coast of Brittany. He did not keep even one ship of the line in reserve. This was as courageous as the British decision during the 1940 Battle of Britain to put all its planes in the sky to challenge the Luftwaffe. Like the Royal Air Force, the French Navy was successful. The ensuing Battle of Ushant in the summer of 1778 was a draw that strengthened French morale and caused a terrible dispute in the British officer corps Naval officer corps over who was responsible for the British failure to defeat the French. Sartine, Vergen, and Maurepas developed the strategy that eventually helped win the war. After being forced by France's new ally Spain to attempt an invasion of England in 1779, 
They subsequently used the threat of invasion to tie down British ships in Europe while they made their own main effort in the Caribbean and North America. The British could have countered by concentrating their own ships in either home waters or in the Western Hemisphere. The divided British cabinet tried to do both at the same time and fell short. Sartine was dismissed in the late 1780s as scapegoat for the thus far unsuccessful war. His successor, the Marquis de Castres, was a former general who won perhaps the most important French victory in Germany during the Seven Years' War, the 1760 Battle of Cluster Camp. Thanks largely to a regimental commander named the Comte de Rochambeau, Castres foiled a surprise British and German attack and saved a vital French fortress on the Rhine. 21 years later, Rochambeau commanded French forces at Yorktown. He received the support not only of his old friend Castro, but also of the army minister, the Marquis de Seigneur, who also had been at Cluster Camp. The victory at Yorktown was a joint accomplishment of Washington's troops, Rochambeau's troops, and a large French fleet commanded by Admiral de Grasse. Before de Grasse sailed from Brest, he had a final briefing with Castro, who had traveled from Versailles to meet with him. By amazing good luck, Castro encountered on his way to Brest an American army officer named John Lawrence, who had been sent by George Washington to inform the French government of his army's desperate need for assistance. De Grasse's splendid cooperation with Washington and Rochambeau doubtless was influenced by Castro's recent meeting at Lorient with Lawrence. This brings me to my final point, the contribution of France's allies to the success of the French Navy. In other wars, the assistance of allied navies was too little or too late. The French Navy could not have achieved superiority in American waters in 1781, had it not been for Britain's keeping much of its navy in home waters to protect against a Dutch fleet in the North Sea and a French and Spanish fleet off the south coast of England. Moreover, the great Spanish general Bernardo de Galvez could have prevented de Grasse from bringing troops from the West Indies to reinforce Rochambeau. These troops had been sent to assist Spain. He generously released them, released them just as he had generously provided supplies from New Orleans for the American army. Moreover, the citizens of Havana provided de Grasse with money to pay Rochambeau's troops, an earlier example of Cuban-American friendship. The campaign of 1781 was a joint effort. On April 1st, 1781, the British Navy had 95 ships in line in service. The 70 French ships in line depended on the help of 54 Spanish and 14 Dutch ships. These, this was the largest odds the British had faced in more than a century, or would ever face again. The United States had only one ship of the line, but the American army tied down 40,000 British troops in North America that could have been used to attack the French and Spanish colonies in the Caribbean. The victory at Yorktown was the result of the cooperation among American, French, Spaniards, and Dutch, a distant forerunner of NATO's cooperation in checking a new wave of Russian expansion. With new threats to face, we still depend on the cooperation of the United States, France, and other friends. May that cooperation and friendship continue to thrive. We should be live. We are live. Um, Hopefully. Uh, it looks like it. Yeah, it's on. So I know there was a hanging question from this morning that was actually asked of Alan Taylor that um, I thought, Jonathan, you could answer uh, about Rochambeau and his appointment. And you've addressed a little bit here, but you know, perhaps there was a, um, political influence. But w I'm, I'm curious if uh, you know, Rochambeau he, uh, was quite simply one of the greatest generals of the 18th century. Um, my favorite Rochambeau story takes place later in his life. During the French Revolution, Rochambeau had the good sense to retire uh, as, on the excuse of ill health uh, before he risked the guillotine. <laughs> uh, Rochambeau lived through the French Revolution and found himself summoned to Versailles by Napoleon. And when Rochambeau arrived, there was Napoleon and all of Napoleon's marshals in full uniform. And Bouchen turned to Rochambeau and said, Monsieur le Maréchal, voici vos élèves. Here are your pupils. Uh, so Napoleon introduced uh, Rochambeau to the greatest generals in Europe as if they were Rochambeau's pupils. Rochambeau was a genuinely great general. Uh, uh, who, which he proved at Cluster Camp, at Yorktown, and on numerous other occasions. He quite simply was the best person for the job, and it would be a wonder that he wasn't appointed. 
Mm -hmm. If you were a general in the French Army, you could choose to serve in the French Navy. It's not really that unusual. When you graduate from the Air Force Academy or West Point or Annapolis, you have a choice of services. You can, you can go from Annapolis to the Army or the Air Force and vice versa. Uh, you've been trained in leadership. And uh, the Stang was uh, one of the only admiral I've ever heard of would go ashore with his troops and lead an attack on fortifications on land, which he did both at St. Lucia and at Savannah. And he also played in a very important uh, diplomatic mission in 1782 by convincing the Spaniards to delay sending their ships to sea to attack Jamaica because he knew they'd be defeated. He managed to convince King Charles III to hold the fleet back lest it be destroyed. Uh, so Destang was a very, very capable man in his own way. He also, uh, there was a survey taken in, I think, 1791 or 1792 of officers in the French Navy as to whether they'd be willing to serve the French Revolution. And the young officers all, all said yes, but Destang was the only admiral who volunteered to serve in the to serve in the French Navy. It did him no good, he was guillotined anyway. Uh, but he's quite an interesting and impressive guy. He was also a good, he also was a neighbor of Benjamin Franklin's and a good friend. Question is uh, the relationship between Washington and Rochambeau. That's a very good question. And that introduces another very important uh, French figure in the revolution uh, who is underappreciated today, the Comte de Chasteloup. Mm -hmm. who was the um, intermediary between Washington and Rochambeau because Washington spoke no French. Uh, in fact, famously during the Revolutionary War, Lafayette invited Washington to go to France after the war was over. And Washington essentially said, no, he'd, he'd rather not because he doesn't speak French and he would be particularly embarrassed in the company of the ladies when he couldn't converse with them. Uh, so he didn't speak any French. Uh, Rochambeau did not speak English or not much English. Uh, they certainly had the same general understanding of what their objectives were, but ultimately their communications depended on the mediation of Chasteloup on, on uh, Rochambeau's staff. Now, Chasteloup was a um, man of letters, a very cultured, a uh, fascinating conversationalist. He had traveled all over the world. Uh, he enjoyed good wine, uh, which Washington did too. Um, and he kind of created the atmosphere that allowed that, that relationship, to, relationship to flourish. Uh, there's a wonderful, wonderful uh, set of letters when uh, Chasteloup leaves for France uh, toward the end of the war. It's after Yorktown. And, um, Chasteloup writes to Washington and says, you know, I bid you a fond farewell. I remember all the good times we had together. Um, and Washington responded that I, I hope to see you again, uh, something to the effect, I'm paraphrasing, over, you know, a good barrel of uh, claret or some wine. He's, and he refers to the hilarity which good claret never fails to produce. So, you know, simply the, the times that they spent conversing over wine uh, and, and just, just developing a personal relationship allowed that much more formal relationship between two men who deeply respected each other. Um, and Rochambeau, I agree, was a great general. And, and I, I think that's even more of a compliment than that he looked on Washington and treated Washington as an equal. Uh, part of that was calculation, but I think also there was a lot of genuine respect there. Lafayette, the relationship between Washington and Lafayette, I think was possibly a bit more calculating than people realize. Uh, Lafayette appeared on the scene in 1777 as one of a horde of would-be volunteers, which Washington was heartily sick to death of. Uh, French, German, Dutch, what have you, they were all coming saying, you know, I was Frederick the Great's number two guy, which Steuben said, uh, <laughs> and, you know, you need to appoint me a major general. Washington was very suspicious of Lafayette and kind of dismissive at first. Uh, Lafayette proved himself on the field at Brandywine. Uh, he was wounded as an advisor. He certainly showed his, his um, passion, his, his verve. He was a very good tactician, despite his youth. Uh, 
There's been some suggestion that Washington saw Lafayette as a son he never had, but Washington also, once Lafayette came onto his staff, Washington also recognized the very public nature of their relationship. Uh, and there have been some studies that have shown that the way Washington treated Lafayette and their correspondence was meant for public consumption. It was, it was meant to demonstrate to the people of France and the United States that, that we're friends, that we can develop a father-son type relationship. Uh, but Lafayette, the, that role that he played through the war, even when he would advocate things Washington disagreed with, like an invasion of Canada, was, was absolutely central to the, uh, to the survival of the alliance. Can I add one thing? Uh, Ed mentioned that, that in 1779, Washington was suspicious of a French army in North America. Uh, as a result of the British invasion of the South, by the end of 1779, Washington became convinced that he had to trust the French. And he announced this to the French by sending a letter to Lafayette, who was on leave in France, saying he would be happy to see a French expeditionary corps in North America particularly if it was commanded by Lafayette. Hmm. <laughs> Lafayette was thrilled, and the French said, wait a minute, this guy's a junior officer, and we got Rochambeau. But that, that was how it was announced. Uh, simultaneously, the French ambassador, La, uh, uh, La Luzerne, sent another letter uh, through more official channels announcing that the Americans were now ready to accept the French Expeditionary Corps. Uh, Benjamin Franklin almost blown things uh, earlier, and, by enthusiastically telling the French that uh, uh, the Americans would welcome a French expeditionary corps, and that had, had very embarrassed, had to back out of it because he was nine months too early. But when the news finally came through, it was in a letter to Lafayette from Washington. Laf Lafayette remarked, uh, we saw this was very interesting, after the, uh, the failure of the, uh, the Newport expedition in uh, uh, 1779, I believe it was, when D'Estaing commanded the fleet and sailed off, leaving John Sullivan's army there kind of holding the bag for various reasons. Uh, you can't blame it on one or the other. Lafayette said that he never felt in greater physical danger at any time of the revolution than when he was walking the streets of Boston <laughs> after, after that uh, failure. So uh, he, he certainly, he had a lot to navigate, and the Americans were not necessarily old you know, the French are here, this is wonderful, now we can relax. There was a lot of tension and suspicion that people like Lafayette helped to allay. He was very personable. He was mm. somebody people could relate to. I have argued on a book on American naval history that the creation of the American Navy was more for political reasons than anything else. It was probably money very poorly spent uh, uh, building frigates that, for the most part, accomplished nothing. Uh, Building a navy was just simply beyond the resources of, of the United States in the 1770s, just as it was beyond the abilities of the Confederate States of America in the early 1860s. It just, navies are incredibly high tech and incredibly expensive, and you got to be a pretty advanced. And the Americans finally built one ship of the line and gave its command to John Paul Jones, but it was it was built with unseasoned wood. The Americans didn't know what to do with it. And after the Magnifique ran aground in Boston Harbor in 1782, the Americans presented it to the French. The French <laughs> accepted it and then quietly a couple of years later scrapped it because it was <laughs> worthless. Uh, it's just too high tech uh, and just was beyond the abilities of the Continental Congress to create. And they spent a lot of money to very little purpose. Yeah, the, the comment was on how when Lafayette returned to France, he was not treated as a hero, certainly in, in the same way that, that he was treated as a hero here. Um, part of that, uh, and I'm not a French historian, so there, there are some nuance there that I don't quite understand, but I think part of it was the fraught political situation in France at the time. Uh, it was not clear with the, the very divided um, situation, you know, is, is Lafayette a true Republican? Is he a closet, uh, you know, or is he more a monarchist? Uh, where does he really fit in? It certainly left Washington in a tremendous quandary uh, when Lafayette's son, uh, in 1795, I think it was, when Washington is still president, 
uh, George, George Washington, he named his son, George Washington Motier Lafayette, uh, has to, wants to escape to the United States for asylum, in essence, because his, his parents have been arrested. Um, and Washington is, is really uncertain how to handle this. He loves Lafayette, he loves him as a son, but he feels, I believe, the French directory was in, in control, uh, that if he accepts Lafayette's son, then he's immediately going to create a diplomatic breach with the government of France. Uh, and it isn't until a number of Washington's cabinet members, I believe Tim Timothy Pickering, says, you know, you really should help this, this poor guy out. Uh, he's in a bad situation. That Washington then invites him to Mount Vernon you know, with, with great happiness. Uh, so Lafayette's situation, you're right, is, is much more complex uh, over there than it is here, where, where he's simply seen as, you know, a very obvious, a savior, you know, a friend of our country. When he comes in 1824, uh, he is treated with tremendous love and affection. Um, great point. One comment about Lafayette in the immediate post-war period, Lafayette may not have been a hero, but he had a, a beautiful house, a charming wife, and unlimited money, and through perhaps the greatest dinner parties of the 18th century, yeah. one of which, among the dozen guests, were Benjamin Franklin, William Pitt the Younger, and William Wilberforce, the founder of the British mm -hmm. anti-slavery movement. So he threw, he threw great parties and had a wonderful time until the revolution came along. Mm. So let, let's not feel too bad for Lafayette in the, <laughs> in the late 1780s. In the 1790s, it's another story. He winds up in an Austrian prison. But he had, he had a great time when he came back after the war was over. Andrew pointed out in, in his talk about how um, William Howe, Washington's adversary in uh, 76 to 78, was by far a superior tactician. Uh, and beat Washington just about every time that they met face to face in the field. Uh, it's interesting you ask that because out out in the uh, in the hallway earlier, I was uh, speaking with uh, Rob Havers, who's here, the president of the George C. Marshall Foundation in Lexington, uh, and along with Kurt Vibrands, and we were comparing Washington to George C. Marshall. Uh, and I think there are a lot of parallels there. Uh, Washington was certainly a tremendous administrator, uh, as I pointed in my too in my brief talk, he had Herculean challenges to, to, to try to overcome uh, of an army that was in an administration that was at times hopelessly corrupt, hopelessly inept by people who just didn't know. We talked about people who didn't know how to build ships. They didn't know how to build armies either, really, except from book learning, uh, as well as a Congress that didn't really understand what was involved. Washington was a brilliant administrator. He understood how, how to both build structures and organizations, how to allocate labor and responsibilities, and how to understand the, the importance of basics and fundamentals, which Marshall did too. But there is an added element that I think goes a little bit beyond is that Washington had um, a very remarkable charisma, and it's the charisma, a, a unifying charisma, that isn't like the flamboyance. It isn't like an FDR type charisma uh, or of communicating to the great public through your speaking ability, but, but it's an ability to connect personally with people through an understanding of his symbolic role as a leader uh, and through an understanding of what he does day to day in his hard work. Um, I often think that the critical moment of the war we mentioned earlier uh, during the panel at uh, Newburgh, uh, New York, when we came very close, as Gordon pointed out, to a coup d'etat, uh, Washington was able to step in and through the incredible trust that he created, uh, convince the uh, rebellious officers to, to step back and to put their faith in him. And he did that by his ability to work his commitment, his dedication on a very day-to-day -day basis because he was not a glory seeker. So those are a couple of the, the main things I would point out. I would also Thank add you. that somebody else that can be compared uh, to Washington is Dwight Eisenhower, mm -hmm. who was an indifferent tactician, mm -hmm. but a great general and a great man. I agree. The story of Washington remaining in the field with the Army in the tented field was also was so important at, at Newburgh that he could say, I've, I have 
stayed yeah. with you the entire time. When the Museum of the American Revolution opens next year in Philadelphia, we will display Washington's original sleeping and office tent that he used through, through most of the war. And uh, we only tongue in cheek refer to it as the first Oval Office, as, <laughs> as the office uh, of the first commander in chief. And I yeah, really see it as a, as a, a sort of political artifact as much as a military artifact. Rightfully so. Yeah. Thank you.